So thank you very much, Nayan Maharaj, for joining today. It's an honor to have your association online. So I have been running this Monks podcast for the last uh, several months. And basically, I started this because I found that uh, a forum where devotees can discuss uh, issues rather than just have one directional classes that can that stimulates the audience in a different way. And of course, I was this was excuse for me to get the association of senior devotees also. So this is watched mainly in India. I am based in India and I travel across the world. I spend about six months in America usually. Uh, traveling and doing some outreach over there. So uh, since uh, uh, I have read you about you, re read your articles and books and heard your classes, it's a great honor for me to have you uh, on this podcast. And uh, today I was thinking, since you have been a part of ISKCON's history, you also studied the history of religions. I have heard your classes on world religions also. So I was thinking we could talk about Krishna consciousness in a broader historical context, you know, how uh, in the Western world, how Eastern spirituality became appealing, how Krishna consciousness also was a part of it and where things stand right now. So it is more like a history of ideas in Krishna consciousness. Is that? Yes. Yeah, fine that's fine. Yes. Fine. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think if I may, I'm going to walk this back a little bit because if we read Mahabharata or Bhagavatam, these great classics, uh, we find that in India there was a different notion of religion than we are used to now in the modern times. And so perhaps I was just talking about this yesterday. We did the class with uh, South America and I was explaining Spanish, now I'm doing English, but uh, if you look at ancient India and probably the best sustained picture we have of ancient India in terms of a, a lot of information about a specific historical period rather than jumping to different yugas and different situations, but a sustained historical window that, of course, would be Mahabharata. And, of course, the two great itihasas, the two great historical epics of India are Mahabharata and Ramayan. Uh, in the case of Ramayan, it takes place much earlier than Mahabharata, so we're not getting as good a picture, let's say, as, of something. Well, let's say Mahabharata is much closer to our yuga, to our historical period. And also, um, the Ramayan does not claim to be or do, is not trying to be a general history of India. Whereas Mahabharata, as the very name indicates, is a history of great Bharata. And we look at Bharata, South Asia, because of course it includes we're talking about regions, certainly including modern Pakistan and including uh, parts of Afghanistan and so on. And so we're looking at South Asia, uh, uh, very there is less information or less events take place, let's say, in South India below the Vindhya Hills, although some things take place there, but not as much. So we're we're really getting a, uh, a sustained, detailed look at North and Central India. Oh. In, or, or, or Mahabharata, I mean, including certainly Pakistan, as it said, and including what is now today Nepal and so on, and even parts of Afghanistan. So, so we look at that culture. Therefore, I'm referring to Mahabharata because I think it gives us a very clear picture of what they understood as religion. There's a very different notion of what religion is. And so I'd like to maybe that's a preface to our discussion. Yes, certainly. In what sense is it different, like not practicing rit pract rituals or what is the sense of religion in the Mahabharata? Not in that sense. They, don't, they actually don't do rituals in the Mahabharata. They most, I mean, not very much. They mostly, it's actually analogous to science. They do what we would call rituals, but 
the the what they're really doing in their fire sacrifices, in the mantras and so on, it's really much more analogous to what, what we call science. It's not identical to modern science, but it's in many ways analogous to it, almost in some ways more analogous than what we call religion today. So the, fir the first point I want to make is that it's remarkable that in the Mahabharata, we do not see really anything like a religious institution. If you think about it, we take for granted today religions like uh, Hinduism is a religion, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism, other smaller groups. We take that as that's a religion. There's, and they have institutions, they have, uh, you know, it's like I'm a Muslim or I'm a Christian or I'm a Hindu or whatever. And there are institutions with hierarchies and so on. So you don't really find corporate religion in that sense. If, I mean, think about the Mahabharata. There, there are no institutions, there are no officers or officials who are responsible, let's say like the Pope or, and, and so on. So um, now in Islam, they, although they say they don't have a formal priesthood, but they really do. And so, um, so if you look at India, for example, it's, it's, I think we can compare it to, well, there's a few reasons why you don't find institutional religion. There are several reasons. One is that uh, they don't have religious wars. They don't fight over religion. There's a much more cosmopolitan, much more mature attitude toward religion, which goes back to the Rig Veda, where it said that uh, even though there's one ultimate truth, different sages invoke it in different ways, like through different names. Yeah. So if you, if you look at the history of India going all the way back, as far as we can go, and, and certainly beyond the horizon of, of uh, normal historiography, uh, they're not fanatical. They have, there's a very cosmopolitan, wise view that, to, and, and this, this view of religion going back thousands of years, this mature understanding, and I'll explain a little later these terms, but we find mo philosophical monotheism rather than tribal monotheism as we find in the Middle East. And, and frankly, the three religions that come from the Middle East, we find a tribal monotheism where my God can beat up your God and this is the real God and you've got something less. So this stands in stark contrast to the philosophical, not tribal, monotheism that you find in the Indo-European civilization. You find it certainly in India, probably in its most, I would say, uh, philosophically advanced and culturally advanced form. But also you find it in the Greco-Roman world. So, what, because we're talking about the Indo-European civilization, and we know by linguistic analysis, we know in, in, that it's obvious that there was, going way back into prehistory, a, an Indo-European civilization. And so, this Indo-European civilization is actually the only civilization in the world, both in India and in the West, that independently developed comprehensive, systematic, philosophical systems. So that, for example, in uh, China, uh, you have wisdom traditions like, you know, Confucius or, or Tao and so on. You have wisdom traditions, but not systematic philosophy, where you systematically go over, for example, ontology, the nature of existence, and epistemology, uh, you know, the nature of knowledge, and logic, and political philosophy, axiology, which is sort of like the philosophy of values and so on. And so you find this as, as original thought, only the Indo-European system in, in the Islamic world, of course, the, uh, the so-called Renaissance, Renaissance, which is a revival of the classical world, ancient mm. Greco-Roman world, began in the Islamic world, which at that time was more, much more advanced and civilized than Europe. I mean, yeah. back then, 
back then the Islamic world was sort of cosmopolitan and the, and the, and the Europeans were sort of violent terrorists. And so, um, so, the, so but, but the Islamic Renaissance it really was based on uh, the rediscovery of Greco-Roman literature. Yes. I think there was a kingdom which fell, the Byzantine Empire, something which fell, and then a lot of uh, ancient texts were discovered. That's when well, this is even, yeah, yeah, but this is even, yeah, yeah, it, it's true, but it began even many centuries before the fall of uh, Constantinople. Oh, okay. So there was the discovery so just, just first. One question, all. Maharaj, when you said tribal monotheism versus philosophical monotheism, generally yes. the Greco Roman religions as well as Hinduism is thought of as polytheistic. So when you say philosophical no, monotheism, no, 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 what that, exactly? That, uh, no, that is. Uh, sloppy history and most people if they engage in history at all it's sloppy history the fact is that for example in plato in the single most famous philosophical work in western tradition western tradition is plato's republic and in plato's republic he explicitly rejects polytheism in fact he says that um homer should not be taught in the paideia which was the internationally famous and prestigious uh, Greek school curriculum. So throughout the Roman Empire, the people who were rich or sophisticated, they would go to these Greek schools of Paideia. And so uh, it was kind of like the, uh, it's, it's almost like, let's say a rich family in America might send their child to Oxford or something, or, or oh, to Paris. Okay. And so so the centerpiece of Greek education was Homer, and Plato says that we should not study Homer because he presents this childish polytheism. And, uh, and so Plato is arguing powerfully in favor of monotheism. And in the Greco-Roman world, there are others, there are many uh, monotheists, but they're philosophical monotheists. They're not fanatical, they're not sectarian. They just talk philosophically about one God. Polytheism was on a popular level. I mean, even it was on a popular level. It wasn't. Um, it wasn't among the philosophers or the intellectuals. They tended more often to be monotheists. And the same thing in India. Uh, you do not find polytheism among the philosophers or the theologians. Shankar was not a polytheist, and uh, certainly Ramanuja and Madhva, and uh, no serious philosopher in Indian history, I think, was a polytheist. Because if you're because if, if you're doing systematic philosophy, it's just like in science. The way science advances is you take lots of phenomena, you take lots of symptoms, or this causes that, that causes this, and you try to find a, a powerful underlying cause or explanation. You know, they call it the grand unified theories. And so... So in the same way, it, it's just the nature of rationality itself, of human reason, that you you categorize. You do basically you do two things in human reason. You you try to find categories. Let's say you see a horse, then you see another horse. But in order to do zoology or science, you've got to have the category horse, yes. not this horse or that horse, but horse. And so, and then you get the category mammal. And then you get the category living thing, and then you get the category life, and so and so you're, so that's what you do. You try to find causes and effects, and you try to find ever greater, in the sense of more explanatory categories. Yeah. And so, therefore, to look for a single truth that explains all truths is rationally required. If you're not looking for that, if you're not looking for something like God or whatever name you use, you know, if you want to work around your own bad childhood experiences. So, so whatever, you know, whatever word doesn't trigger you, unless you're looking for an ultimate truth, you're not a rational human being or you're rational up to a certain point. Then you cut off, you get off the elevator and, and you say that at this point, I will no longer be rational. I'm no longer looking for truth. I'm no longer looking for a greater category that explains all other categories. And so, for example, if you look at Aristotle, Aristotle says there's a God, 
but he, he says it's logically required. Aristotle is not like a real religious guy. Uh, mm. But he says that philosophically, it's required. And he calls God, among the different names, he calls God the unmoved Unmoved mover, mover yeah. So because in that sense, Aristotle's giving an argument from contingency. And the argument from contingency is that, as the Buddhists have noticed, uh, if you look around the universe, everything that we can detect in the universe uh, has a beginning and an end, is contingent, is caused by something else. And so therefore, since nothing exists independently and everything depends upon something else, the simple question is, why does anything exist instead of nothing? Because we can do a thought experiment and we can imagine a universe in which nothing, well, we can imagine that there's not a universe. We can imagine that nothing ever existed. So therefore, Aristotle's reasoning that the world does exist, and therefore there must be a non-contingent being. There must be something that exists that does not depend on something else for its existence, and therefore by you break the infinite regress of causes and effects. Hmm, yes. As Aristotle's concerned with breaking infinite regresses in various ways. And so, so my point is that um, if someone is not looking for the supreme category or the supreme entity that explains all other entities and categories, then that person is simply not acting rationally. They have given up the great human project of trying to reason one's way to higher truth. There's no rational way that one cannot look for a God, or if you don't want a religious entity, you just want a supreme cause like Aristotle, you can call it the unmoved mover, but you have to be looking for that. And so therefore, in Greco-Roman civilization and in India, people who were rational, who were philosophical, were not polytheists because polytheism ultimately is not a serious okay. explanation. Not only that, not only that, um, if we look at polytheisms around the world, including, uh, well, uh, you know, the Greco-Roman world, including just all over the world, you, know, you find these polytheisms, what we find is that practically none of them assert that the gods are the original cause. Practically all these monotheism, uh, polytheisms, practically all the polytheisms assert that above this community of gods or goddesses, there is another higher cause which actually explains things. And so even the polytheists didn't really believe yeah. that they were given a serious explanation of where everything comes from. So that's why... Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So then, well, would it... Because people, because, you know, the, the mass of people, they're not looking for philosophical truth. They're looking for money. They want, you know, they want grandma to get healthy again. They want, uh, you know, to defeat their enemies. They're, they have very worldly desires. And therefore, they really don't care about ultimate philosophical truth. They just want to know who exists out in the universe, in our world, here in the physical world, who has the power to give me what I want. And so because in fact, there is a cosmic administration, it's just natural, there's a cosmic administration, there are in Sanskrit, they're called devas. And uh, so, and even from Sanskrit, we even get names in other languages, like for example, Jupiter, uh, we have the word uh, deva uh, or divya, like diva, like heaven. And so uh, the root form in Sanskrit is dyu, D-Y-U. And then, of course, Peter is father. So Jupiter means father of heaven. Oh, okay. So, so therefore... People, ordinary people are not philosophers, are not transcendentalists, are not looking for ultimate truth. They just want to get by, and therefore they negotiate 
with whoever can give them what they want. Okay. That's, that's where you get polytheism. Uh, what was the basis for the sense of unified identity? Was it acceptance of the Vedas? Because Buddhism was, and Vedas was, soon came was, and they didn't accept the Vedas. Yeah. Yes, we'll get back to that point. In the Mahabharata, it's based on shared culture. And, a share, and everyone accepts the Vedas as powerful, even the Asuras. The Asuras always yeah. have their hired Brahmins. Jarasandha, he had his Brahmins. They all have their Brahmins. And they all do because, and that gets back to the point about science, because the, the Yajna, or the Yajna, however mm. you pronounce it, uh, is science. I actually, I'll, I'll, tell you the base, I'll tell you the basis of the Vedic science, in my view, having studied it. Is that first of all, you have a, an, an amazing ontological fact. Ontological being the nature of existence itself. Yeah. That is because as Krishna, and Krishna, because Krishna, as he explains many times in the Gita, Krishna is everywhere within everything and everything is within Krishna. What that means is in terms of physics is that every point and a point, you know, technically is the smallest location. Every point in the universe is within every other point in the universe. So just think about that for a moment. Every point in the universe is within every other point in the universe through Krishna. Mm -hmm. Now, that being the case, there is absolute interconnectivity of all points in the universe. Okay. And so if you can somehow or other plug into the act, when you are at any point in the universe, you are actually at every point in the universe. I mean, as you can see, there are all kinds of possibilities here technologically. That's how yogic mystic powers came about, when they could access higher dimensions. Well, that's, I'm talking about the nature of the universe, why these things are possible. Okay. Now, here's another point. It's just like if you have a computer screen, you have icons. Hmm. The icons can be connected in various ways to physical objects in the world. For example, you can click on an icon and a bomb can go off somewhere. You can click on an icon, you can do remote surgery. Hmm. Now they have, you know, you can do remote surgery because you are, what you see on the screen represents, in other words, you have a micro uh, cosmic icon that represents a macrocosmic object. Yeah. Now, actually, the way to understand Vedic sacrifice is that the arena, the sacrificial arena, was a computer screen. Interesting. So that, yeah, so that, so that, for example, I mean, scholars, what they do know, they don't understand all of this, is that in, 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 in Vedic culture, when you're, there were, first of all, there were two categories of sacrifices. One was the domestic, the griha. There, there's a Vedic literature called griha sutras. Those are like domestic sutras or home yeah. sutras. And those were sacrifices that the higher castes would just do at home, like daily Agni Hotra and so on. But then you have the uh, Shrota Sutras. Hmm. And, and these were sort of like great state events. It's just like, for example, there are certain things that only a state, a political state, can afford to do, like have an army or provide electricity to everyone or something, you know, things like that. So. So there were these, what, what in Harvard they used to call solemn rites, where, where they would have these great events, these great sacrifices, which were also, by the way, an important part of the Vedic economy. Because uh, if you look 
for example, at great Swayamvaras or, um, you know, Ashwamedha, just all these great Vedic sacrifices or great weddings, the kings would distribute very generous charity to the people that need it. And there were two classes that needed charity, poor people, people who were sort of involuntarily poor and shudras, and Brahmins were voluntarily poor. Okay. And actually, it's just like, for example, when, um, when a Brahmin came through um, Varnavata, not Varnavata, um, Ekatakra, where the Pandavas were hiding uh, incognito after the house of Lack, uh, Brahmin said to them, you know, there's going to be a great yagya. There's, or there's going to be a great event at Draupadi Swayamvara. And so why don't you go there? Yeah, and you could, you know, and so yeah. But what's interesting is that Brahmins, if you read the Mahabharata, Brahmins from all around, from all around the country, were going there because that's that was their economic basis. Because at those great, great events, there would be a very generous distribution of wealth, cows and clothes and jewels, and that's how these people lived. So, so, so these great events, these great sacrifices played an important role in the national economy. But also, but also at these sacrifices, uh, in, in the sacrificial arena, you have three fires. That's very well known. And so you'd have, you'd have a fire to offer to the gods, a fire for the forefathers, and then a you know, fire for, for this world. And so for, for what you actually wanted to happen in this world. Hmm. And so these fires were like computer screens, because, but the icons were not pictures, they were sounds. The mantras. And so, yes, the mantras and individual words. And that's why, you see, in, if you look at the Itihasa literature, Mahavarata, Ramayana, or the Puranas, Itihasa, Puranancha, Panchamoveda, Uchate, which are said to be the fifth Veda. What's interesting is the power is in the idea. Just like, for example, when Prabhupada does his Bhagavatam, he says, I'm sorry, but English is not my first language, and he's translating from Sanskrit. None of that matters because the power is in the basic idea. If you understand the idea, that's why you can have so many Mahabharatas. You can have so many Mahabharatas because if you basically understand the story, it's the story, it's the idea. Whereas in the Vedas, in the Karmakanda Vedas, the power is not in the idea. And that's why there are no, you know, the power was in the actual sound, because the sound was the science. And therefore, you have that famous case given in the Bhagavatam, where, um, the, yeah, where, the yeah, where um, Tvashta, Tvashta, David, Tvashta wants to perform a sacrifice to produce a powerful being who will kill Indra. But now what happened is that he was supposed to chant Indra Shatru. Indra Shatru, an accent Shatru, which means I'm producing a the mortal enemy of Indra. In other words, he was supposed to, by pronouncing Indra Shatru, it's a Tatpurusha compound. Hmm. which means that, anyway, oblique, semantic relation, anyway, I won't go into all the grammar, but what it means is that it stands for Indrasya Shatru, that to produce a being who is the Shatru, mortal enemy of Indra. In other words, will kill Indra. But due to inattention, he said Indra Shatru, instead of Indra Shatru. So Indra Shatru, with that accent, it becomes a karmadharya compound, which just me anyway, I won't go into all the technical grammatical language, but it's it means Indra will be the mortal enemy of this person. Yes. And therefore Indra will kill him. So just by mis just by misplacing one accent. It's like, for example, let's say for let, let's say you're building a rocket. And, and and of course it has all kinds of computer stuff in it. And let's say you just make one little mistake, instead of taking off, it explodes. Right? I mean, yeah. in the real world, 
you can make one and and so therefore the vedic sacrifices were a physical science then that's why i said their concept of religion because just like nowadays people you know most they call it religion you could call it hinduism or christianity but what are people actually praying for you know most people are not approaching it as a transcendental spiritual thing they just want something and therefore if you just want something why not just do science and that's what people did so back then the brahmins didn't think they were doing religion when they performed sacrifices they were scientists oh if, if, okay if you, if you have a group of scientists working in a laboratory it's not religion it's science and so most of the brahmins were not doing religion they're doing science it's amazing yeah so in a sense karmakanda was more like science because karmakanda does the same thing what science does and prabhupada also yeah it's not about religion it's just like when you when you do science modern science they only work with the entities that they're aware of they're not aware of devas and therefore they're not they're not aware of all these things they're not, not aware of higher powers therefore they're doing a gross material science although what we find is that now with the quantum mechanics headache you know the wave and the particle and spooky action at a distance and everything Hmm. because the universe is not merely gross physical things there they've got a problem it's just like for example let's say let's say you're a little child and your parents are rich and they own a big estate let's say hundreds of acres and so as a child you think that your parents property is the world because you're a child and as far as you know there's no limit it's just you know as far as you can walk in any direction it's your parents it's your family property mm. but as you get older and maybe you get a car you realize no there are fences around our property and most of the world is beyond this and that's what's happening to quantum mechanics science is growing up a bit and they're realizing that the physical world is just one little part of reality hmm. and so so the difference between the vedic science and the modern science is that in the vedic science they were aware of a much larger portion of the universe hmm so that's why we can also have brahmanas who were serving asuras they were not Because in concern with ultimate reality I, 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 Kim Jong Un, you know that crazy person in North Korea, he has scientists. Every every murderous tyrant has a, has a scientist. Hmm. Okay, that's a provocative example, but I think yeah, that's true. So well, look at Kung. So look at Kung. So. Yeah. I mean, I mean, these are asuras. If you take, if you take. Um, like the like Jarasandha Kangsa Shishu Paul I mean, they all had their scientists yes ravana had his yatudhanas what's that ravana had his yatudhan yatudhanas the brahmins there rama but the point is he they yeah. did the sur don't have brahmins because at night they sit down and you know eat puris and and drink hot milk and hear hear about the soul i mean and, you know that's not what they're doing okay although it's interesting because in the bhagavatam when kamsa was even kamsa sometimes in the bhagavatam sometimes talks about the soul and so so the point is that um but it's more for utilitarian purposes he just wants to it, get off the hook entirely it's, a, it's not mostly it's entirely for utilitarian purposes yeah Yes, so the, so the, brahmanas, the brahmanas were the scientists and most of the, and, and so the number because look look at it this way let me give you one example from the bhagavatam which i meditated on but i'm doing mahabharata as we know 
in the tenth canto, Dashama Skanda, Bhagavata Dashama Skanda, the tenth canto of the Bhagavatam, when uh, Kangsa and his evil ministers, when they find out that that actually the devas have come and they're sending their anshas or sending their incarnations like the pandavas were incarnations of demigods and krishna himself is coming that's and so and so what do the advisors advise them they say they say when they heard that krishna's taken birth that you should you know will kill all the newborn all the male babies born in the last 10 days. And we have to kill the Brahmins. Brahmins. Who are helping, who are helping Vishnu. Yeah, it's in the Bhagavatam. That way, that, okay. you know, that the okay. Suras. And it's even in the um, Mahabharata. That, you know, they, but now here's my point. In fact, they didn't kill all the Brahmins. And why would they kill Brahmins? You have to think about that. Why? So, also because there are Brahmins around the universe, why just kill the Brahmins on Earth? Why would that? How can they destroy Vishnu by killing Brahmins on one little planet? What's the connection? So I, I really, st- I really stop to think about this, and I think that Krishna. I think I understand what they were, what they meant. First of all, um, not all Brahmins were Vaishnavas. In fact, Krishna says in the Gita that yoga nashta parantava, the spiritual science has been lost. Hmm. And we know from the Mahabharata that when Krishna came, most of the Brahmins, or many of the Brahmins were not worshipping him. But still, why would you kill Brahmins? How does Krishna, how does Vishnu lose power? If you kill Brahmins, I think there's an obvious answer in the minds of the Asuras. I was trying to figure out what do they mean. The Asuras, who were advising Kongs, were actually very modern. They had the same philosophy as atheist science. They, had the, they were actually atheist scientists because in their mind, and this is also, it's a type of Mimamsaka philosophy. Is, I mean, think back, in, in the minds of the Mimamsakas, who are obsessed with performing Vedic rituals to go to heaven, the, the slogan, the motto of the Karma Mimamsa group is uh, Swarga Kamo Yajeta. Swarga Kamo, one who desires Swarga, heaven, yes. Yajeta, must offer sacrifice. Yeah. And so in their minds, because... I actually took a class on the Mimamsas at Harvard by Christian training. So for the Mimamsaka school, or Karma Mimamsa, the power, and this is very modern actually, they're actually very modern, the power is in the mechanism. There is no God who controls it. And even if there are devas or, some, or Vishnu, whatever, the, the Mimamsas are sort of like... Um, what's the word, obsessively categorical. They categorize everything. They're very, you can see these are people that later in Indian history, you know, became te- technologists or computer tech. So they're very extremely categorical. And they categorize the gods, devas or Vishnu, as just paraphernalia. It's like in the same category as something like a little cup to hold water. It's just paraphernalia. If you're doing a sacrifice, you need paraphernalia. And one paraphernalia is the names of the devas. It's just part of the mechanism. Somehow those particular phonemes, those particular sounds just are part of the machine. That's all. Otherwise the gods have no power and they're not interesting. So the asuras were actually, they were physicalists. They believe, not exactly a modern physicalist, but they believe the power is in the mechanism. That somehow or other the universe exists in such a way. It's like if you're a scientist, let's say there's a law of gravity, there's this, there's that, there's Einstein, space time, whatever it is, you know, who knows why that's not our job. We just know that's the way the universe is. And so therefore, if you want to create bombs, if you want to create technology, 
If you want to create a better smartphone, you just use the universe as it is. It's a mechanism. You learn how the things work and where does it come from? We don't know. We don't care. We're just using the laws of nature as they exist. That was the view of Collins and his ministers. It's simply the way the universe is that when you perform a Vedic sacrifice, when you chant certain mantras, it unleashes power in the universe. No interest in why. And so therefore, from their point of view, when the Brahmins worship Vishnu, the Vaishnav Brahmins, they didn't want to kill other Brahmins. The Vaishnav Brahmins are building this high-tech thing, which is the Vedic sacrifice, which generates power, and they are channeling that power into Vishnu. So Vishnu is not empowering the Brahmins, they are empowering him. Oh, okay. So they are putting Vishnu in the same material world with its sources of mechanical sources of power. And they think, okay, so yes. it's like one country would destroy it's the nuclear reactor. So one country yeah, might destroy the weapons of another country. So like that, they are thinking we'll destroy the yagyas that... If, I could be, if, you're, if you're the head of a country and you tell your scientists, build me a bomb. Like let's say Iran. You know, the, 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 uh, those fanatics and, you know, the fanatical leaders of Iran, they tell their scientists, build us a bomb. Yeah. We want missiles. We need accurate long-range missiles. And so from their point of view... Or, or let's say for so America or Israel, let's say they'll try to get rid of those scientists because the, okay. the leaders, the religious fanatical leaders of Iran, they're not giving power to the scientists. The scientists are giving powerful weapons to the leaders. So if you get rid of the scientists, the mm -hmm. leaders won't have military power. So that's how they understood the relationship between the Brahmins and Vishnu. Vishnu is a politician. The, the Brahmins are scientists. They are feeding into Vishnu this tremendous power of the Yajna, which has its own power. It's just the way the universe is. That you, you just do certain things, certain technology. It just generates power. And then the Brahmins are channeling this power into Vishnu. So if you kill the Brahmins, it's like you kill the nuclear scientists in Iran, they won't have bombs. Yeah. That makes sense. So, Maharaj, you're saying that this kind of performance of Yajna was the unifying sense of, it was the unifier for uh, broad Indian culture? Or well, what was it at that time? It, it, that was, it was just, it's just like nowadays, whether you're a Hindu or Christian or Jew, uh, you go to a dentist. Okay. Because it's just science. Okay. And so these sacrifices were just science. And so anyone that wanted something, you it's, it's like, you know, let's say you want to take a trip. If you're a Hindu or a Christian or a Buddhist or a Muslim or a Jew, you fly on a recognized airline because they have the technology. Yeah. So, so if you are, if you are an asura five thousand years ago, you need scientists. How can you run a government if you don't have scientists? Okay. It wasn't. It wasn't about religion. It was not about religion. Even when all these asuras, let's say, worship Lord Shiva in order to get different boons or the power, or whatever power, they're not interested in Lord Shiva. It's just like, for example, let's say, let's say there's some country that has nuclear weapons, like let's say Pakistan has nuclear weapons, and so some other country wants it, so I'll just go there and, and you know, give them billions of dollars and they will you know, accidentally lose some of their formulas and it'll end up in our pocket. Hmm. And so, you know, it's the same thing. Basically, you just go and bribe Lord Shiva, or you give him money, or you give him worship, and then he'll give us powers. It's just commerce. You just buy what you want, and, and the sacrifice is the technology. You have to think of Vedic sacrifices as like playing the cultural role of computers. Okay. So then we could almost call these as 
secular in the sense that although there is some worship, but it was not the object was not the worship. Not religious. Okay. So then, when Jayad Ratha, when Jayad Ratha worshipped Shiva to get the power to keep the Pandavas out of the Kuru Vyuha, the military formation. Yeah, Chakra Vyuha. They had no religious interest in Vichiva. Okay. They weren't doing, that's not religion. They were just they were just acquiring power. It's not religious. Mm. So then was there no a religious unifier at that time for people? So because you talked about philosophical you know, ironically, monotheism. Ironically, ironically, the culture of the Mahabharata. The society, the Indian society in Mahabharata is not that religious. Because if you look at it, if you look at it uh, in the Mahabharata, which is a corrupt text also, by the way, as Madhva Sripad Madhvacharya says that. So it's, it's a corrupt text, but still everyone in the Mahabharata really just wants to go to Indraloka or Swarga. In other words, it's just like, let's say people in India now, there are many people who would like to get an American green card, isn't it? Hmm. I mean, if you walk down a street in India just giving out American green cards. It'd be a stampede. A of... It'd be a riot for that. Yeah. 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 So what people want in the Mahabharata basically is a green card for Indraloka. So Maharaj, if we don't call that as religion, then then almost all of Christianity and all of Islam, we can't even call that as religion, isn't it? Because there also people are aspiring for heaven. And uh, there also it is not so, maybe there are few people who are aspiring for pure love. I can say I mean, if you want, you could call it, you certainly wouldn't call it spiritual. Although what you find is in every religion, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, there are some spiritual people. Yes, of There course. are people who really are interested in cultivating love for God. Let's look in the dictionary about what the word religious means. Okay, it's related to religion, so let's just look up religion then. The belief in and worship of a superhuman controlling power, especially personal God. You see, but it's not a good religion. You see, that religion, that definition is based on the, it's it's based on drawing a a um, a distinction between that which is empirical and non-empirical. You could say the devas are not empirical in the ordinary sense, although they are empirical because there is a process to see them. Hmm. And so, basically, it, that's a definition of religion and the definition of science are coming out of the cultural values of a materialistic society, especially a society in which. Uh, intellectual life is controlled by unreligious materialists. And so therefore, and go back to the definition of religion, because you can say religion is a pursuit or interest to which someone ascribes supreme importance. Example, consumerism is the new religion. And so okay. therefore, you see, what they don't distinguish in the dictionary, because it's a materialistic dictionary, is that some people are religious in the sense that they actually want to realize their own soul, become aware of their own soul, and they want to go to a spiritual realm or live a spiritual life. Some people have recourse to devas, demigods, or supreme god, or some supreme power just because they want material things or they want to go to some material heaven. So you can call it religious and it is called religion, but it's not, there's no real interest in spiritual life. Yes. And that's why nowadays people make this somewhat sarcastic distinction between religious spiritual. and spiritual. Yeah, spiritual but not religious, they say. Yeah. Yeah. So then, even in the Mahabharata's time, uh, so Krishna consciousness was it also quite rare? Because in Bhagavatam also we have Mukta Nam, Siddha Nam, Rasudhi Narayan Parana, Sudurlubha Prashantatma, Kotishwapi Mahamune. 
that among millions there are there is one devote one devoted to the lord so krishna consciousness even in those times was quite rare people were so when you talked earlier about philosophical monotheism was that primarily among the intellectual elites and people themselves in general were doing their own worship was it like that yeah to some extent for example there there are stories where krishna is traveling he'll come to a city what was that city um my god i'm so rusty it's a city where um shuta dev and bahulashwa he meets that one yeah 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 where were they oh where is the city that janaka was from the king janaka mithila mithila yeah mithila yeah mithila so <clears throat> Krishna will come to a city and in that city there are some very good devotees a few I mean Krishna it's interesting because also it's described when Krishna is going from Gujarat from Dwarka to Hastinapur or Indraprastha that the 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 roads are lined with people they want to see Krishna so Krishna definitely was a super rock star I mean I mean when he appeared okay Krishna was and people knew a lot of people knew that he's not an ordinary human being but then but then again it's a time when demigods would come and the suras would come and so there was a lot more interplanetary commerce it was it was not like the world we live in so most people knew Krishna is not just a human being i mean only the, the you know the most foolish people thought that so just but you can be so to say oh he's not just a human being or she's not but that's like okay there's there's like a number of people like that okay you know and so that wasn't that alone did not make you god or even close to being god you could not be a human being and that's what the asuras were banking on that's what they were they're thinking okay okay christ right powerful the, the stories they knew Krishna wasn't a human but we we're not humans either because they were actually asuras and so okay they felt Krishna was just a living being who had acquired a lot of power because of these you know noxious brahmans that are channeling the yagya shakti into Krishna hmm. so um so religion if merely believing in something supernatural then you could say harry potter is a religion or you could say you know the uh you know people witches and warlocks you know there it's a religion so any anything's a religion any any yeah, type star of, wars is filled with sup, with supernatural elements also so almost everything yeah you, yeah well star wars i think star wars the idea is it's just much more advanced material technology but but something which is if you compare star wars to lord of the rings in lord of the rings it's a completely different kind of technology it's magic or harry potter so you could say harry potter is a religion because it's belief in supernatural things things which are beyond so but ultimately you could say about the magic in harry potter you could speak about the advanced technology in the fictional star wars you could talk about religion you could just say that religion just means that people appeal to or are depending on certain forms of reality or technology that we don't know about at the present time and yet that's too broad for religion because because see the the dictionary definition is not very good the belief and worship of a superhuman controlling power but if you believe in some kind of science fiction world view there's some higher beings who are not human and are controlling us is that really a religion it says especially a personal god or gods but that's not necessary for the definition yeah. it can be a particular system you see they called faith and worship but what if you what if you have faith that there's some planet with these higher beings or superhuman but they're not it's not religion and uh so the definition is not it's it's not a great definition 
Okay. And let's say you, you honor because the word puja in Sanskrit means worship, but also means honor. And and if if you're trying to get power from something, you know, you if you're trying to get a, a make a deal with a rich person, you worship, you honor the person, you take them out for a meal, you praise them. So it's, you know, we honor people to close business deals. We honor people to get admitted to prestigious universities. So we honor people for a lot of things. So if you have a combination of honoring and the person is not just a human, then you, according to the dictionary, you have a religion. But that's much too broad, and it just it doesn't really get at what we often mean by religious. Okay. So, uh, the topic we were discussing was Krishna consciousness and historical context. So then you explained quite beautifully about how at the time of uh, Mahabharat hung things were and how in the contemporary things things changed because of say the uh, installation of monism. So even at that oh, no, time, no, actually, I would say no, no, not because of monism, because of tribal monism. So because that for tribal example, monism, yeah. So for example, you have these fanatical religions, most you know, basically coming from the Middle East, where they say this is the only way, or everyone should do this. I mean, if you look at the history of Islam, you look at the history of Christianity, it's this very aggressive, militaristic. Uh, spreading of their religion and clearly with the understanding that we're better than everyone else and if you don't have our religion you don't really, you know, even though you could say there are countervailing statements in the Quran or the New Testament that could, you could take to indicate well other people also are in touch with God but in practice, you know, very militaristic if you look at Indian history where Hindus were often second class citizens in their own country and so, um, or the idea of this really cute little charming practice of destroying the sacred places of the people you conquer and putting, you know, a church or a mosque there. Mm. And, uh, I mean, you go to a country, you invade it in the name of God as if God wants you to kill and subjugate these people. They have sacred places in their religion. You desecrate their sacred places and you put your own church or mosque or something. I mean, clearly, uh, you know, there's something really wrong there. Yeah. So, therefore, I say tribal monotheism. Tribal monotheism. Yeah. There was monotheism in the Greco-Roman world. There was monotheism in India. It's just, but it's not recognized as such because they didn't kill each other. Okay. So now Krishna consciousness, if we consider in the Mahabharata time also was relatively rare. So then in today's world also we have people practicing, but then can we really expect that it will become like a mass practice or like a, yeah, like a world Dharma? Yeah. Or do we expect well, more? Doesn't hurt. Doesn't hurt to try. I mean, I think I think that there will always be plurality religion, and of course, obviously, let's say there was a world where Krishna. Con In fact, we know. For if you look at Indian history, one thing I found very remarkable because I, I taught the history of Indian religion, which is really just Indian history at the University of Florida, of course, and um, it was just remarkable how. Because India, of course, just were many kingdoms back then. And so it was remarkable how very often when you had a state in India, you know, whether it was Maharashtra or, you know, just all these different parts of India, where there was a Hindu ruler, it seemed like normally, not always, but normally, there would be equal rights for everyone. But when you had a Muslim ruler, there wasn't equal rights for everyone. And so it was... Uh, it, was, it was an academic book I was reading, but there was a, a, a real contrast between the attitude of Hindu leaders and the attitude of Muslim leaders a lot of the time in terms of how they treated people outside their own religion. Of course, it's not every time, it's not everywhere, but still, there was a, no question that was the tendency. Okay. 
yeah but you know there is a lot of uh, historical revisionism going on where often islam is painted in a more charitable light and uh, desecration of because, because, the, because the, yeah because there's an assumption which is very strong nowadays in general and that is things may be ultimately just things of, of science or scholarship like ethnic groups races the muslims in india and so the point is if a particular even though even though it may be an empirical area if a particular view in your mind will lead to immoral acts then you change the history or even to explore the science is evil because ultimately if you believe that the consequences of certain views empirical views the consequences will be immoral then to hold those views even if they are empirically would say you can make empirical arguments for them to hold those views is itself evil and the evil of those views is not really based on whether they're objectively true or not because even to study it is considered bad but rather you have to hold the views a priori because they're necessary views to hold in order to ensure that very bad very immoral acts aren't committed so therefore it's saying that it's interesting it, it it's subordinating any type of even the very notion of empirically studying something is rejected in favor of a metaphysical principle that we want certain kinds of equality and justice and certain views regardless of what the science says about it cannot be enunciated because they lead to immoral behavior and, even, and so immoral, even immoral is defined subjectively say for example because there is a fear there will be islamophobia so anything critical about islam will not be spoken and and that will be deleted from history also or at least it yes. will be revised yeah so, so so the actual history is irrelevant history does not have its own integrity history should not be studied for its own sake to find out what actually happened you write history only to uh promote certain moral values not to find out what actually happened so is this the influence of the left maharaj or means how is this ideology coming up that idea should i see i see the influence of whoever has intellectual power when the right has power they want to write history it's like you know, i mean i mean let's say who who could get a job as a history professor when hitler was in charge of germany okay and so i'd say you know when you have passionate people in power whatever moral views they espouse they demand that history be told in favor of those views and to have leaders who are actually um objective and just sort of academically neutral that happens sometimes it's just like so um history you know it's funny the marxist intellectuals in india it's so funny they're they're so absurd because what they conveniently don't look at is that marxists murdered between 10 and 20 times more people than hitler according to the russian arrest according to the russian archives state archives stalin killed about 40 million people and then mao killed as many or more you have the khmer rouge in cambodia you have you know little fidel castro turning the whole island of cuba into a prison a prison a prison island and killing you know machine gunning in the back anyone that just tries to sail a boat to some other place and so and then you have in marx by the way and people say well no they just didn't understand marx oh no they did i looked it up and actually you find in engels and marx a a very clear justification of genocide because they are sort of in the in the pseudo <laughs> 
in, in, in the pseudo kind of pseudo social science of their age, because, you know, they're, because science has gone way, way, way beyond where they were. So it's sort of like the, uh, the crude, the crude social science of their time. They believed, I mean, they actually, Marxism is based sort of on this sociological determinism. The idea that, um, People don't have that much free will, unless, unless I guess you're Karl Marx. But and 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 people in general tend their views tend to be shaped by the social structures and economic structures that they live under. And so, therefore, they say. I think Engels wrote this in 1849 that you know you may have to just eliminate entire social classes. So. Another word for that, a direct synonym of that, would be genocide. Let's say, for example, you have a let's say you have a country where there are twenty million capitalists. You have to liquidate all of them. You have to kill all twenty million of them because they are sustaining economic and social and political structures, which force people deterministically, which is you know, to believe certain things. So, and that's why when Marxists got power, that's exactly what they did. They started killing millions of people because you have to eliminate whole segments of society. So the fact that this unscientific genocidal monstrosity, you still find intellectuals supporting it in India also, isn't it? It's just, it's just, uh, it's one of the wonders of the world that these people actually think they're intellectuals. Yeah. It's horrible. You know, there is, for example, even China, Muslims are being persecuted and there are millions of Muslims who are in those pre-doctrination carry education camps, as they call them. But a few incidents in India and there is a huge outrage or a huge... Uh, so, well, yeah. well, there is actually there there is actually international outrage of the Uyghurs. A lot of people talk about that. So, um, yes. but still, um, yeah. Anyway, I guess I we've talked a long time, and we can continue yes, in another discussion. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. I just tried to summarize. It was a wonderful discussion. You know, I I will if you would like to add something in the summary. Then we we talked on the topic of. Krishna consciousness historical context. So you started by how there was no institutions in the time of the Mahabharata. And then... Not, before, not, not as we have nowadays. Not, not as, as we, we have, have institutionalized religion as we have it. So we talked about how there was philosophical monotheism. At a popular level, there were different kinds of worship. And then we elaborately discussed about polytheism and monotheism. How the... Search for religion, so reason means search for some broad unifying categories ultimately in you culminating in God or some ultimate reality. And then you talk about how religion, especially in terms of the Karmakanda worship, was more like science rather than anything metaphysical. And Hinduism in modern times, as it has been constructed, is based on a very a historical understanding where monism was used as a political tool for unifying and that led to almost like a destruction of Vaishnavism which was the most prominent expression of uh, devotion or spirituality in India and that's why our Acharyas were quite vehemently critical and then later on we talked about towards the conclusion how there is uh, <clears throat> this, this uh, tribal monotheism has been very destructive but uh, there is like Krishna consciousness, there's always the opportunity for us to share it. And thank you very much, Maharaj, for this wonderful discussion. As I feel there are so many bulbs which were going on in my head, you know, so many points were connecting, <laughs> and especially the explanation of why they were demons were trying to kill the Brahmins also. That was quite amazing. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for hosting me. Thank you. Humble obeisance. So, Hare Krishna, Hare, Hare Krishna. Krishna.